The patient with cleft lip and or palate. Cleft lip and palate are the most common of the many types of congenital craniofacial anomalies. Cleft lip or palate may occur as isolated conditions, but frequently occurs as part of a syndrome with other birth defects. The prevalence varies between one and two per 1,000 births, but this ratio varies based on geographic and ethnic distribution. Cleft lip occurs more frequently in males, while cleft palate occurs more frequently in females. The person with a cleft lip and or palate can be dentally dysfunctional unless extensive habilitative care and supervision from birth is available. An interdisciplinary team of medical and dental specialists is required to provide adequate treatment and family counseling as needed. The dental hygienist can be a member of the team with responsibilities to coordinate dental and periodontal care. Speaking ability and appearance are among the first factors considered when the long-range treatment program is planned because of the objective is to help the patient lead a normal life. Dental personnel need to maintain a current list of the health agencies, clinics, and other community resources where the patient and family can obtain assistance for the various phases of treatment and rehabilitation. Classification of clefts. Classification is based on disturbances in the embryologic formation of the lip and the palate as they develop from the premaxillary region toward the uvula in the definite pant pattern. There are seven classes. Etiology, the embryology. Cleft lip and palate represent a failure of normal fusion of embryonic process during development in the first trimester of pregnancy. With normal fusion, no cleft of the lip results. Fusion begins in the premaxillary region and continues backward toward the uvula. Formation of the lip. It occurs between the fourth and the eighth week in utero. A cleft lip becomes apparent by the end of the second month in utero. Development of the palate. It takes place during the sixth to twelfth week. A cleft palate is evident by the end of the third month. Risk factors. Multifactorial genetic and environmental factors can be significant. Rarely a single factor can be found as the specific cause of the cleft. Geographic. Cleft lip and or palate are most common in Asian and American Indian children. African children are least likely to have clefts. 1 in 2,500. Family history and genetics. Present or past member of a family increase the risk as well as increase maternal age. Alcohol, tobacco. Diet, folic acid, vitamins, and zinc. Medication intake during pregnancy. Teratogenic agents include phenytoin, vitamin A, corticosteroids, and drugs of abuse. Occupational exposure, pesticides, lead, aliphatic acid, and organic solvents. Lack of adequate prenatal care and instruction is risk factors that has influence on the all environmental factors. General physical characteristics, other congenital anomalies. The incidence of multiple congenital anomalies is high with cleft and lip and palate. At least 275 syndromes have been identified in which clefting is the primary feature. Facial deformities. These include depression of the nostril on the side with the cleft lip, deficiency of upper lip, which may be short or displaced backward, overprominent lower lip, infections, Predisposition to upper respiratory and middle ear infections are common. Airway and breathing. Craniofacial anomalies of the nose and throat area predispose the child with a cleft palate to airway, obstruction, and breathing problems. Early treatment intervention is necessary for the infant to cope with beating problems. Speech involves breathing and swallowing. Speech. Patients with cleft lip and or palate have difficulty making certain sounds and may produce a nasally tone. Anatomic structure, airway and breathing problems, and hearing difficulties all contribute to speech problems. Hearing loss. The incidence of hearing loss is significantly higher in individuals with cleft palate than in non-cleft populations. Oral characteristics. Tooth development. Disturbances in the normal development of the tooth bud occur more frequently in patients with cleft than in the general population. There is a higher incidence of missing and supernumerary teeth, as well as of abnormalities of tooth form. Common missing teeth, maxillary lateral incisor, maxillary premolar, mandibular second premolars, usually correspond to the side of the mouth that has the cleft. Malocclusion. A high percentage of patients with cleft lip and palate require orthodontic care.
Orthodontic treatment may be required after each stage of surgical treatment for the cleft palate. Open palate. Before surgical correction, an open palate provides direct communication with the nasal cavity. A cleft makes it more difficult for a child to suck on a nipple. Special nipples and bottles, such as the Haberman feeder, have been designed to make feeding easier. A cleft palate may cause formula or breast milk to pass into the nasal cavity. A prosthetic palatal obturator may be constructed to aid during drinking and eating. Muscle coordination. A lack of coordinated movements of the lips, the tongue, cheeks, floor of mouth, and throat may exist. Compensatory habits may be formed by the patient in the attempt to produce normal sounds while speaking. Periodontal tissues. Dental biofilm accumulation is influenced by the irregularly positioned teeth, inability to keep the lips closed, mouth breathing, and difficulties in accomplishing adequate personal oral care, especially around the cleft areas. Patients with cleft palate and lip have increased levels of gingivitis and calculus accumulation. Dental caries. Children with a cleft lip and or palate are at a higher risk for dental caries. Risk factors relating to mouth position, teeth, problems of mastication, diet selection, and dental biofilm retention are intensified for the person with a cleft lip and or palate. Feeding difficulties of infants and toddlers have contributed to early childhood caries, also known as ECC. The treatment. Treatment is coordinated by a team of specialists and is based on the patient's progress at each age period. Members of the interprofessional patient care team are all listed in box 49-1. The team is responsible for providing integrated case management. Quality and continuity of care are essential. Need for attention for gingival health throughout the years of treatment cannot be overemphasized. Intraoral and or extraoral appliances can be used in preparation for primary lip and palate surgery, including active and passive appliances, lip tapping, lip strapping, and nasoalveolar molding technique, technique. Cleft lip. Surgical union of the cleft lip is made at two to three months of age, a general well-known rule for scheduling surgery when the child is approximately 10 weeks of age weighs 10 pounds, and has achieved a serum hemoglobin of 10 mg over ml. The infant's general health is a determining factor. Purposes for early treatment, aid in feeding, encourage development of the maxilla, pre-maxilla, help partial closure of the palatal cleft, assist families in adjusting to the birth of a child with cleft lip and or palate. Orthodontic and dental facial orthopedics. In preparation for cleft closure, orthodontic and orthopedic treatment may be needed to reduce the protrusion and stabilize the premaxilla. Cleft palate. Primary surgery to close the palate is usually undertaken by the age of 18 months or earlier when possible. The combined efforts of many specialists are required. Goals for treatment. Produce anatomic closure. Maximize maxillary growth and development. Achieve normal function, particularly normal speech. Relieve problems of airway and breathing. Establish good dental aesthetics and functional occlusion. Types of secondary surger, surgical procedures. Secondary surgical care refers to additional surgical procedures after primary closure of the clefts. Secondary surgery may involve the lips, the nose, the palate, and jaws. Objectives are to improve the function for coherent communication and improve appearance in both. Treatment plans are individualized to fit the needs of the patient. Team evaluations on a periodic basis determine the effects of treatment and outline the next phase. Use of bone grafting. Bone grafting is used to repair residual alveolar and hard palate clefts. Alveolar graft. Placed before eruption of maxillary teeth at the cleft site. It creates a normal architecture through which the teeth can erupt. A need for future prosthetic replacement of missing teeth is reduced. Support is provided for teeth adjacent to the cleft areas. Hard palate grafts. Provides closure of oronasal fistula. Helps to relieve a compromised airway. Sources for autogenous bone for graft. Rib, iliac. Rib, iliac crust, skull, mandible, or bone morphogenetic proteins. Use of osseointegrated implant. After bone grafting, implants can be used to replace individual teeth. Implants also provide support for a complete prosthesis. Prosthodontics. Types of appliances, obturator, a removable prosthesis may be designed to provide closure of the palatal opening. Speech aid prosthesis, a removable appliance to complete the palatal pharyngeal valving required for speech. Purposes and function of prosthesis. 
The prosthesis may be designed to accomplish one or all of the following. Closure of the palate, replacement of missing teeth, scaffolding to fill out the upper lip, masticatory function, restoration of vertical dim dimension, pro post orthodontic retainer. Orthodontics. Treatment may be initiated as early as three years of age, depending on the dental facial development. Each stage of surgery treatment may require orthodontic intervention and follow-up. Final formula orthodontic treatment for realigning the teeth and gaining a functional occlusion may start during the mixed dentition years or later. During the orthodontic treatment period, an intensive program for dental caries prevention and gingival health is maintained. Speech therapy. Training is started in very young in children. Therapy is essential following surgical or prosthodontic treatment. Restorative dentistry. Dental hygienists practicing with a pediatric dentist or general dentist are involved in the direct patient care. A major problem can be dental caries leading to tooth loss. With missing teeth, major difficulties arise related to all phases of treatment. Preservation of primary teeth has special significance. Dental hygiene care. Preventive measures for the pr preservation of the teeth and their supporting structures are essential to the success of the special care needed for the habilitation of the patient with a cleft lip and or palate. Teeth will often be poorly formed, lack of enamel, and be at risk for loss uh, due to decay. Each phase of dental hygiene care and instruction takes on greater significance in light of the magnified problems of the patient with cleft lip and or palate. Every attempt is made to avoid the need to remove teeth, especially around the cleft area. In an area already weakened by lack of bone, removal of teeth creates further complications. The presence of teeth encourage optimum arch growth. Parental counseling and anticipatory guidance. Understanding the value of preventive procedures by the patient and parents is accomplished through explanation and instruction. When the patient has not had specialized care, the dental team has a responsibility to arrange referral to an available agency, clinic, or private practice specialist. Primary concerns are daily dental biofilm removal and prevention of early childhood caries. The objectives for appointment planning. Frequent appointments scheduled every three to four months are usually needed during the maintenance phase of the patient's care. Objectives include the following. To review dental biofilm control measures, to provide encouragement for the patient to maintain the health of the supporting structures and cleanliness of the removable prosthesis, to remove all the calculus and biofilm as a supplement to the patient's personal daily care procedures, to supervise a dental caries prevention program for both primary and permanent dentitions with fluoride and sealants, appointment considerations, patient apprehension and self-esteem. A patient who has seen often in clinics may become apprehensive about dental and dental hygiene care. Lower self-esteem and difficulties in social interaction have also been noted with patients with cleft lip and or palate. Communication. Speech. Speech may be difficult to understand. With repeated contact, understanding can be developed. Referral for speech assessment, if not already done, is recommended. Hearing. Depending on the severity of hearing loss, the approach is similar to that for speech difficulties. Suggestions for care of patients with hearing problems are described later on. Provide motivation. Use of a motivational interviewing approach can help patients gain a positive attitude towards oral health. Patient instruction, personal oral care procedures. For a small child, the caretakers may be afraid of damaging the deformed area or hurting the child if cleaning methods are employed. An empathetic approach and plan for continued inner instruction over a long period is needed. Personal daily care, select toothbrush, brushing method, and auxiliary aids according to the individual needs. Fluoride, initiate daily self-application of fluoride by, a, by way of fluoride denifers and diet supplements for a young child in a non-fluoridated community. Rinsing instructions. Only older children, at least age six years, and evaluate for ability to rinse without swallowing are given mouth rinse. Instruction on how to rinse is needed when this procedure is new to the patient. Prosthesis or speech aid. Halitosis may be a problem because mucus secreted in the nasal cavity as well as by them accumulates on the prosthesis and must be thoroughly cleaned on a regular basis. Diet. Need for a varied diet. Include adequate proportions of all essential food groups. Need pre for prevention of dental caries. Limit cariogenic foods, particular, particularly for between meals and snacks. Between meal and snacks. Smoking cessation. The patient or family member who smokes or uses any form of smokeless tobacco should be informed about the effect of tobacco on all the oral tissues. Emphasis on the potential damage to the periodontal tissues can have special significance for the patient with a cleft palate. Offer assistance with smoking cessation program. Dental hygiene care related to oral surgery. 
Pre-surgery. Treatment object objectives have particular significance because the patient with a cleft palate is more susceptible to infections of the upper respiratory area and middle ear. Every precaution should be taken to prevent complications, post-surgery, personal, oral care. After each feeding liquid diet for several days, soft diet for the next week, the mouth is rinsed carefully. Oral care is needed and accomplished with great care, usually by the parent or caregiver to avoid damage to the healing suture lines. In selected cases, a toothbrush with suction attachment may be useful. Documentation. The documentation of care that the patient with a cleft lip or palate receives over the individual lifetime is imperative. Documentation includes the following. Description of location, classification, and extent of cleft. History and status of surgical interventions, missing teeth and related recommendations for self-care regimens, description of prosthetic appliances and recommendations for daily care regimens.